Hi everyone, this is Tom Trams with the FujiNet Project, and I wanted to make a status video showing the current progress being made for the IEC version of the FujiNet, which is intended for computers with the IEC bus, such as the Commodore 64, 128, Plus 4, Commander X16, and others. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we are progressing very quickly. Especially thanks to Jamie Johnston and his Meatloaf project, with which we are using a considerable amount of code to handle bus control, arbitration, and interaction. To start, we'll actually kind of show a little bit here of how we communicate with the FujiNet. Since the FujiNet uses the IEC bus, it therefore uses the kernel routines and is thus very easy to interact with. For example, we can send this command right here to device number 15 to its command channel to set the SSID with colon separated commands to set the network and the password. And so on. Since I'm already configured here, I'm just uh, going to bypass that right there, and we're going to move on. We'll start by using the network device. While we do have devices 8, 9, 10, and 11 reserved for the virtual disk drive here, uh, those are still being worked on. We need to fold in the file system support, etc., to make all of that work. That will be coming, and I will be making a video on that shortly. Not right now. We're going to use the network device today. The network device is actually at 12, and because we have subchannels, you can have up to uh, 15 separate network connections coming in and out of the network device. 0 and 1 are typically used for load and save, so we can, for example, do this. I can communicate with my TNFS server. and grab a copy of adapter config, which is a simple basic program that shows how to communicate with the FujiNet device to get the network configuration. Oop, looks like we have a slight glitch there, but, hmm, darn. Okay, we'll try that again. Yes, we're still working out timing issues here, so expect some hiccups, expect some pauses, expect some reboots. I ask again for your patience. Oop, and I accidentally missed it. Okay, that again. TNFS, TMA2, adapter, config, if I can type. Again, and for some reason we have glitches here, but the program should run as is. Okay, so there we are with the host name, the uh, IP address, the network configuration, and all of that is literally being done with just standard input commands. And if we actually take a look real quick, we can see that we have. They're just opening up the command device, uh, and grabbing the inputs, printing out the input. Very easy to work with, very easy to interact with. We'll go ahead and just kind of bounce through that. But that's all we really need to do to do things like grab the adapter information, set the SSID, mount disks to a particular slot, that sort of thing. We'll continue by looking at what we actually have on the network file server right here. I'll bring that up here. We have a handful of files that we can use here. For example, we can load a game. We'll do that by specifying again the full name. MA-2, and we can do 
Drills, for example, loading from device 12. It loads, and while it's loading here, I'll take a few moments to actually explain what's going on here. So it has started the stream to the TNFS file server and it fed it to the Commodore. In this case, the FujiNet was able to take and grab the information so fast that it was able to take and buffer it entirely in its own memory here at which point it takes and serializes out the IEC bus, which we are currently just using the stock protocol here. Uh, so it will work with all of the existing uh, machines. Uh, we are wanting to take and add in support for Jiffy DOS and some of the other fast loaders as well so that we can improve performance. These are things that are slated on the docket. They will get done. But even at this point, uh, the network interface is actually quite usable. Now, you don't have to actually use just TNFS here. There are actually a whole bunch of different network protocol adapters. But we'll show right here, the game loaded. Everything works just fine. We'll come back out again, slightly reboot, and it looks like I need to jostle my capture device. Give me just a moment. Okay. And for this next trick, what I'm actually going to do is instead of using TNFS, I'm actually going to take and pull this from an SSL encrypted web server. Pull the same game again. It really doesn't matter. So, if I take and specify HTTPS, for example, it will use the HTTPS protocol to pull the game down. And I'll use one of my domains here. I have a little file part here, just right there. Boom, boom, boom. It does the SSL transaction. Okay, looks like we have a slight timing error, which we can take a fix. If, like I said, we're still working through it. Let me take and just jostle this ever so slightly. One, two, three. Make sure we're okay. And try again. And it looks like, yeah, we're definitely getting a case of the demo jitters here. We'll try this one more time. HTTPS, yeah, from device 12, perform, grabs, and it's pulling it down from the web server. Now, I'll take this moment here to tell you a little bit about some of the other protocol adapters that are available. You can have TCP and UDP connections. So if you wanted to take and put a basic program on the other end of a netcat connection and send it down the pipe you can it works uh, there are also connections for http and tnfs like you just saw there there are also connections for ftp servers as well as local file sharing protocols such as smb and nfs and we want to add many more for example uh, we would love to add support for Google Drive and Dropbox, for example, to access those directly. We can because of the muscle that's provided on the FujiNet itself. And if you would like to take and help us do that, please click on the Discord link that's in our movie description. And as you can see right here, just like we did from the TNFS server, it loaded from the HTTP server. The only difference was what, how, which protocol was actually specified. But you can see it just worked. Let's take this a step further. We can actually take and do, for example, uh, I'll load in the C64 DOS switch. That's also sitting over here on my network file server. helps if I actually specify the file server here. But I'm doing it this way because I'm gonna show you something that can save some keystrokes here in just a moment, just like the DOS switch. I have to specify the protocol and file server. 
And you find yourself doing that over and over again, but you actually can save yourself a few keystrokes. We load up again, there's our C64 wedge, and I'm gonna make do a small little adjustment here. So I can load the other part of the DOS wedge here from device 12. Again, because we're using the standard kernel routines, this just works. And it's loading this off the network too. Oops. I actually need to set a prefix. We'll go ahead and do that. Why not? We can just as easily make it do that here. <laughs> this is what I get for improvising. PMA dash slash DOS one. Load our wonderful little binary. Oh, what? Okay. There we go. Bam. It's loading it in and in a few moments. It is absolutely going, the demo gods are going to kill me every time I try to do this. No big deal. Come on. There we go. So now we have the DOS wedge in place. Again, these are timing issues that we're working out here. and We are working to take and clean all this up. Anyway, so now we have a DOS wedge loaded in and we can send commands to the FujiNet just fine by specifying either the control interface so we can do things like set the SSID or mount images to, 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 to drive slots or to the network card so we can use the network card directly. And for this, I'll actually take, and instead of loading, uh, I'm actually going to take and send a prefix command. Keeping shift to prefix. And we're going to set a prefix for channel zero, which is the loading channel, just like say channel one is the save channel. And channels two through 14 can be used for other network connections. And do this, okay, prefix zero. And we're going to take and set this to my TNFS server again. So now that's set, and we can then turn right back around. And instead of having to type the URL again, we can just take and use the file directly. The FujiNet will take care of prepending the prefix that we set above. So now it's done that, and it is now taking. Oh crud! I forgot to I forgot to take it and do, um, but that's fine. You can see there it's taking and loading that in. We shouldn't need to go through all of that. We'll just take and reset there. Okay. So that kind of gives you an idea. Yes. So basically, really easy to talk to the FujiNet, and you can even use your existing DOS wedges and whatnot to talk to the device. It works. Um, so that gives you kind of a quick little run through of how this works. How does this work for data connections, for example? Well, pretty easily, it turns out. Let me take and bring up a, a simple little netcat window here. I'm going to take and kind of just slowly fold this in. Instead of moving from this window here, I'm going to use my terminal. And we're going to open up a little listening connection over here on this machine on TCP port 6502. It's now listening on that connection right there. Now we can take and open up logical file number one. We can uh say device 12 and we can say device number two as our first connection to the network here because zero and one are automatically wired for load and save and yes save is working too uh so anyway uh connect up and all we have to do is specify an, an address of what we want to connect to in this case a tcp socket running over on my system on port 6502. You'll notice here that I'm using 
uh, I'm actually using host names. I don't have to stick to IP addresses if I don't need to. So I'm going to open to that connection right there. And you can see right there immediately the connection has been received. And uh, sending, to that, uh, sending to that connection is easy. There you go. So, I mean, how much easier can it possibly get? I would show input over here, but I can't use input directly. Oh, well, we close the connection, everything's out. It's none the wiser. And you have a number of other things that you can do with the network device, such as setting the channel modes to use the JSON parser so you can parse JSON immediately. I will be showing more of this in depth in upcoming videos. I wanted to show you kind of where things are right now. So with that out of the way here, I'm actually going to finish with the last little demonstration here, which is that the printer actually works. So for that, we actually need to just open a connection. Again, I'll use logical file one. I'll open from here. I will open up to zero. And at this point, I will simply take and print something. Right there. And at that point, that's all we need to do. It will automatically take and rasterize that out. And I can take, and now I can pick that up in my web browser. Give me just a moment to set this up so I can do that here. Of course, I'm doing all of this entirely on the fly. One second, window capture, change my window capture real quick. In my Chrome window. Oh, isn't that just spectacularly sexy? So I'm going to go to my host name, which is just Commodore. All right. Excuse me. Thank you for. Going where I asked you to. And we'll come right down here. I will scroll down. And we see right here that we have a standard Commodore MPS803 that's set up here. And all I have to do to grab the printout, select it, and it downloads. Point, I can then view it. There it is. That's how easy it is. We're taking and bringing all this up as quickly as we possibly can. But with that, I'm going to basically end, uh, end the video here. Uh, there's still a lot of work left to be done. But hopefully here, the whole plan here is to try and get people interested, to try and help us, not just in testing, but in helping us finish out the firmware. I hope you will help us in, and join us on this adventure to take and make and bring uh, the wonderful FujiNet network adapter that we've spent the last four years developing onto uh, the IEC bus for all the Commodore and Commander X16 machines. So until next time, guys, have fun.